our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also
the children of the congregation to come forward for children's sermon. Grace and peace to you, friends, the one in whom we live and move and have our being. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I wonder if any of you were a little bit luckier than I was, if you were able to catch the northern lights either Friday night or last night. If you've spent any time on social media this weekend, I'm sure that you've seen the pictures from people around the country posting even cell phone pictures of the beautiful colors in the night sky, the auroras that have been visible in the United States in kind of an unprecedented way. Both Friday night and Saturday night, it caused ribbons of pink and 
purple and green light across the night skies. And I saw some here from Virginia, of course, especially in the Shenandoah Valley, Valley area, but even outside Richmond. I, where I was, I went outside and it was a little too cloudy, and I don't know if the light pollution would have covered it anyway, but not far from here, you definitely could see the northern lights. Northern lights, as you may know, are caused by particles from the sun interacting with gases in the Earth's atmosphere. It's usually something you can only see in latitudes clo closer to the north or south pole. I was lucky enough to see them many years ago in South Dakota when I was working out in the Badlands, which is famous for not having many lights around it. The night sky is very visible. But usually you need a really dark sky and you need to be kind of closer to the poles to be able to see them. Well, not the past couple nights. Visible in the United States, in continental United States, almost from California, even as far south as Alabama, for the first time since the 1940s. And the reason for this is there's a big geomagnetic storm. You may have, I don't know how many of you read all these articles about all this, but I, I get really into this. It was a G5 extreme storm that NASA says that it happened very rarely. Um, it happened last, I guess, in 2003, but before that it was even longer. And it can cause disruptions to radio frequencies and stuff, so scientists have to kind of make sure to follow all of this, but it also creates a spectacular beauty. Right, it, this solar storm comes from a cluster of sunspots on the sun's surface, 17 times the diameter of the Earth. We're talking just massive scale here. The spots are filled with these magnetic fields that can act as slingshots, throwing huge amounts of charged particles towards the planet. Space scientist Rob Steenberg says that the beauty in the night sky that we can see from this is really a gift from space weather. He says, don't forget to go out and look up. And maybe we'll see it again tonight. We'll see if the clouds are, uh, stay away. But when something spectacular happens above us, we look up, don't we? I, I tend to. Especially if something like these northern lights, or earlier this year, of course, we had the eclipse. We weren't supposed to stare right at the sun, but, you know, kind of do the safety, and we, we want to look at it. Spectacle invites the idea of looking at it. Even the word itself, spectacle, of gazing upwards. And boy, what a spectacle do we have in our gospel this morning. The ascension of Jesus, which is in some ways actually something we don't usually talk a lot about, given how important it was to the early church. We don't doesn't come up in our conversations quite as often as, say, the crucifixion or the resurrection. Although, it's right there alongside of those in our creeds every week. Part of the reason for that, maybe, I think, is that the day itself is usually celebrated in the middle of the week, on Thursday, this past Thursday, because it's always 40 days after Easter, according to the timeline laid out in Acts, and so it always falls on that Thursday, but... I think the more of the reason is that it is quite a hard story to really get one's mind around. Very spectacular. Jesus lifted into the air as he departs from the disciples. He says goodbye. He blesses them. And promises to send them a helper, an advocate, the Holy Spirit. Which will, of course, lead us into Pentecost next week, as I told the children. But what about this story? The wonder that the disciples must have felt in this moment. Perhaps the sadness and the loneliness of Jesus physically departing, not to be able to be next to them and eat with them, as in all these post-resurrection stories. And the confusion, right? It kind of seems arbitrary. Why, Why are you leaving, Jesus? It's this great tug and pull of presence and absence. Jesus, whom they thought they had lost, comes back in the resurrection on Easter morning. Everything seems right with the world. But that's not the end of the story. Jesus' mission is one more final point. As Ephesians says, he goes to sit at the right hand of God. Well, this is a lot of a lot of lingo. What is going on? What does it mean to sit? 
sit at the right hand of God. Well, theologians over the centuries have talked about this in many ways, but you know, Lutherans, Luther of course has an answer. I, I think his is pretty good. He says, the scriptures teach us that the right hand of God is not a specific place in which a body must or may be. Luther talks about the right hand of God not as the opposite of the left hand of God, right? <laughs> it, it, it's not this literal thing, but it's rather, it's the seat of God's power. Whenever ancient kings or ancient rulers in um, literature um, from that time, um, like an emperor's right hand, they're always talking about the power of the emperor or the power of the king. And so the right hand of God in time can be nowhere and yet must be everywhere. It's not in any one place, but it's also in every place. He compares Jesus's, uh, he compares the risen and ascended Christ to sunlight streaming down on us. And this is, I think, particularly good. I, I mean, if you want to substitute in the word aurora instead of sunlight, by all means. The bright rays of the sun are so near to you that they pierce into your eyes or your skin so that you feel it. Yet you are unable to grasp them or put them into a box, even if you should try forever. You can you prevent them from shining in through the window. You can prevent the rays of light from shining in through the window. This you can do, but to catch and to grasp them you cannot. So too with Christ. Although he is everywhere, he does not permit himself to be so caught or grasped. For Luther, what it meant for Christ to be seated at the right hand of God means that God's power in the world will forever now have the shape of Christ. Jesus doesn't rise to heaven as this mighty, powerful figure like, again, everyone imagines the Messiah to be this conquering hero, but rather as the crucified one. The beginning of Luke, he again reminds the disciples what it means to, for him to have been the Messiah, that he, he had to suffer, that he has wounds in his hands, even after the resurrection. And it is this Jesus who now expresses the power of God in this world. The one who suffered was crucified, and whose mercy is beyond all that we can imagine. They're not catchable. Its light can shine on us, but we aren't in control of it. We can only welcome and receive Jesus wherever he is present. However, even though we can't grasp Jesus in the world ourselves, there is actually a few places Luther goes on that we can. In the places that Jesus has said that we can grasp him. And where are those? Well, in the water, in the bread, in the wine. It's in these places, these physical places, that we can grasp Jesus, that we can experience the physicality of Christ in our lives. God's power is present everywhere. We catch glimpses of it as we live our lives. But we can't grasp it outside of the places where Christ is for us. Beyond the bread and the wine and the water, Christ is also present here in the body of Christ, the church. This is an amazing moment where Christ empowers the church which will continue on Pentecost to continue being the same type of Messiah that he was. One that lives and loves and gives oneself for others. As the disciples are trying to grasp all of this, as they're trying to figure out what in the world is going on as Jesus ascends, they gaze up at this spectacle. And I wonder if you notice that line that comes after it, this other strange, strange detail that the disciples are gazing up, Jesus is ascending, and suddenly there's two mysterious strangers among them. Two mysterious men clothed in white, and they say, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? Why do you gaze upwards? 
Well, if I'm a disciple, I'm going to say, well, did you miss it? Like, look, at, look what's happening. Look at the spectacle. Why do we stand looking upwards? Well, that's the silliest question I've ever heard. But it's not. These two men broke in white remind the disciples not to look for God's power and this mighty show of force from on high, but rather to look for Christ among us here in the present. To take our eyes from the sky and turn them to one another, to our neighbors. <clears throat> Today, Jesus teaches a different kind of truth with his ascension. Not even just with his words, but with his actions. Of this new reality waiting to be born. Of Christ's love coming in through the world in upside down ways. Even his choice of location. He leads them out to Bethany, this place that was so close to Jesus in his um, time before the crucifixion, where Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus lived, where Jesus had raised Lazarus. There's different scholarships on this kind of neighborhood outside Jerusalem of Bethany, but there's some intriguing, um, kind of, there's some intriguing um, hints that this was not just this ordinary little town. That the name Bethany may translate to something like the house of affliction. It was where the city of Jerusalem sent people who were poor or who were sick. It also explains why the caves were so readily available for Lazarus when he fell ill. Perhaps there was a homeless shelter there or a hospital for lepers. Bethany was built out of sight of the city so that no one would have to see all the pain and ugliness in the affliction of the human condition. But that is precisely where Jesus spent most of his time. These are the people Jesus chose to spend his time with. He poured out his love for those in need. And Bethany is the last place on earth Jesus chose to be seen. Among the poor, among the suffering, among those whose need for God stretches all bounds. And now, as he ascends, he comes and he infiltrates the whole earth, filling every need, being every moment where God seems absent, God is most present. In the same way that God seems absent on the cross and yet was doing God's most powerful work, in Christ, God's power comes to us in the places we expect it least. We are not called to look our heads up to heaven and hope for power from on high, but to search this world, this present reality, for Jesus' love among us. So let the love of God shine down on you, but don't look for God in glory. Look for him in the world. Look for him in simple water and wine and bread. Look for him in the body of the community of Christ. Look for Christ in the places of need in this world. People of God, why do you stand looking up to heaven? Christ is still present for you here and now. Thanks be to God.
before we get to birthday times, it's the day of shining lights. Here's one. Right. Here's the shining lights. Back from her world college travels is Bella Shilly. And a special shout out to Robert, who just became an Eagle Scout. <laughs>
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your heart. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks for grace. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should in all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ, who enthroned forever in your right hand is alive and present for us always. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join our ending hymn.